Good evening. All right. We're going to start our Sunday evening off worship service with uh, hymn number 317. 317. We'll sing one, two, and four. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I owe no other master, my heart shall be Thy own. Thy life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for Thee alone. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace, such love constrains me to answer his call. Follow his leading and give him my all. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. For thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus, earth's little while. My dearest treasure, the light of his smile. Seeking the lost ones he died to redeem. Bringing the weary to find rest in him. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I owe no other master, my heart shall be thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for thee alone. I'll be reading tonight from Matthew 14, 23 through 33. I mean, 25 through 33. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked in the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand 
and took hold of him and, his, and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they, when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And, they, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. all three, 251. It may not be on the mountain's height or over the stormy sea. It may not be at the battle's front. My Lord will have need of me. But if by a still small voice he calls to pass that I do not know, I'll answer, dear Lord, with my hand in thine. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Perhaps through <coughs> loving words, it's Jesus would have me speak. There may be now in the pass of sin some wonder whom I should seek. O oh, Savior, if thou wilt be my guide, though dark and rugged the way, my voice shall echo thy message sweet. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. There's surely somewhere of a lowly place in earth's harvest field so wide. Maybe through life, excuse me, short day for Jesus the crucified. <clears throat> oh, trusting me all to thy tender care and knowing thou lovest me. I'll do thy will with a heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Let's have prayer. Gracious God, we again come before you as we assemble as the body of Christ here at Stroudsville. We thank you for the privilege of sharing uh, our aspects of worship and praise, and we pray that we might all be uplifted by what we mutually share together in this. Father, be with Brother Tom this evening as he directs our minds in the Word. Uh, we are thankful for him and for Meg 
as they labor among us. Father, we're thankful for our, our deacons who so often work among us uh, uh, so well that they almost go unnoticed except for when you need them and, and they're such a blessing when they're among us and what they do as the quiet servants uh, of yours here. We thank you for our eldership. They are our shepherds. They have the oversight of our souls and we know that that's a heavy burden to bear. But Father, we pray that you help them bear it, that you fill them with the Holy Spirit so that they might know that it's not then and of themselves that this can be done, but it's through you. So we pray that you bless all here that are involved. Be with Joanne as she works so tirelessly in the office to uh, see that things go well, that we're informed, and that is such a blessing. Father, help us never to take one another for granted. We have our VBS upcoming, and we pray that you be with Shannon and help her. It's very difficult uh, to do this year after year, and uh, we need to show our appreciation to Shannon for all that she does. We're thankful for all of our members here. There is not a soul here that's not a valued part of this effort here at Strasville and your service. And we're thankful for everyone. And we praise them because you praise them. And so we should honor and prefer one another above those of the world, but not let that hinder us from reaching out to a lost world. So, Father, we, uh, we pray also that the ministry that we have embarked on to reach out to the lost might be blessed by you, and that's the only way that it can succeed. Father, we do have some uh, members that are suffering loss at this time. Especially we pray that you be with uh, Clint and Becky Rose and Leah and that family who have lost Becky and Becky's mother. Um, uh, such a young woman, and such a so sad time for that family to lose uh, a, a grandparent uh, and a parent as they have. So, Father, help our hearts uh, ache for them. Help us sorrow with them and help us rejoice with them in knowing that Becky's mother did not have to suffer long like so many have uh, before you take, take her, took her. But, Father, we also say, think that uh, we sometimes lose sight of the, our goal, and that's to be with you for an eternity in heaven. And that has been only possible through your son Jesus on the cross. Never lose our focus, never lose our purpose, and never lose our desire to please you as the, as the songs we just sang. Make that our sole purpose is to please you and stand before you justified through the blood of Christ on the cross for us. It's in this, his name we pray these things, Father. Amen. Mark your hand books. Are there any invitations up there? 466. Rob and I were joking on the way here. Every time it's my turn to lead the singing, I lose my voice. I don't know why. Is that what it is? I, just, I don't know why, but uh, just keep sucking on those cough drops and, <laughs> and uh, hope we get through it. So, uh, Tom mentioned the song uh, based on the lesson based on the song tonight and the first thing that popped in my head was this next song which was also based on a true story true tragedy uh, right after the civil war a ship was lost uh, from a lighthouse where the main beacon was lit but the lower lights which i did not understand till i started researching it also had to be lit to delineate the shoreline and whether through negligence or whatever a tragedy occurred, there was a great loss of life. And Mr. Bliss, who wrote this song, after hearing a sermon from D.L. Moody on it, uh, was blessed by the Holy Spirit and wrote this immediately after. And I, I thought this was always an interesting one. So this is one I wanted to sing this, uh, tonight together. Uh, if everybody would stand with me. And just for three, vo three verses, let me keep my voice.
Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his light house evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Dark the night of sin has settled, Loud the angry billows roar. Eager eyes are watching, longing for the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother, some poor sailor tempest-tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Thank you for those songs, Stephen. I didn't know that one before that you sang. That was an interesting song. So appreciate that. We are going to do a, a story behind the song, and I appreciate Stephen selecting that one, kind of a maritime rescue song. But uh, it's 272 if you want to refer to it in the songbook. We actually have more stanzas in that that I found in my research. But um, anyway, the first slide after this is one you've probably not seen in a typical lesson. And um, yeah, I was actually on the Okoe. Anybody else been on the Okoe before? It's a fun ride. Uh, I was in an eight-person raft. I think, Meg, you have to remind me, you had had Nathan and Emily already, but they were still really little. Oh, you had Nathan only. Emily hadn't come along yet. So Nathan was just a little tot. And here we are with some friends on the Okoe eight-person raft. The first rapid that was us, and uh, we flipped over. My brother was in the raft, and I remember that as soon as I came up out of the water, I felt or heard something whiz by my head, and it was a, uh, a rescue line. They have these bags. I don't know if you've seen the guides on the river, but they're mounted on their hip, and they saw that we obviously were probably going to need to be rescued because we were all floating around and bobbing in the water. So I heard these rescue lines go flying past me, and the next thing I heard was uh, my brother, who's, I think his foot got hung up in a rope that goes along the side of the raft, so he's trying to get up out of the water, but his foot is hung in the rope, and he said, I can't get up, I can't get up, you know, he was trying to, like, grab the raft, and, and so, anyway, we were all rescued, and my children, or Nathan was not an orphan, fortunately, but we made it, you know, it was, it was sort of a fun but scary time. Uh, the Koei River is kind of a serious deal. The very last rap rapid, which I can't tell you in worship service, but if you've been in the Koei, you know the name of it. Uh, it's a class four rapid. It's a pretty serious rapid. One time we went over it, and I learned later a person was down under the water, pinned to the rock, and their lungs filled it with water, so they had to be resuscitated. So this is kind of serious stuff. It's fun, but scary at the same time. So we're thankful that there are rescuers, and we're thankful that people are trained and know how to throw lifelines when you go in a rapid and get crossed up and 
So I'm thankful for that. So our lesson tonight is throw out the lifeline, which is number 272. We're going to talk a little about that story. Uh, the next thing I wanted to point out in Luke 19.10 was that Jesus came for one primary reason, and that was to seek and save that which is lost. Now, church, you're going to hear me say this until you get tired, so I'm sorry. I'm going to apologize ahead of time, but I'll keep saying this. And I'm, not going to, I'm not going to quit. The mission of the church is to reach lost people, all right? The purpose of the church is to fellowship and be with each other, and I know sometimes we enjoy being with each other. We're even entertained, but that's not why God made the church, the church is made as a lighthouse to rescue lost people, people that are shipwrecked, people that are, that are, let's just be honest, that are destined for hell and maybe don't even know that they're lost. It is our, it is our responsibility if we follow in the steps of Jesus to reach out and save lost people. And sadly, I think we need to repent. A lot of congregations today have forgotten their primary directive. If you go and look in their, in their four years, you'll see lots of activities filling up their calendars, but very few, if any, activities to reach the lost. God forgive us, and we need to repent. We need to realize that we need to change our priorities and focus on reaching lost people. I believe fellowship is terribly important, encouraging each other, being here, and loving each other, and hugging on each other. And, and supporting one another is all important. I think fellowship meals are wonderful, and we need those. We need activities that bind us together as God's people. But if we forget, in the midst of all of that activity, to save lost souls, then we need to repent. Throw Out the Lifeline was written by Edwin S. Ufford. I believe I'm saying that correct. In 1888, in the late 1800s, Evangelism was sort of in, a, in an all-time zeal or peak. There was a lot of missionaries and, and circuit preachers, and, and that's when the, um, the great religious campaigns were in, in America. People were crisscrossing and preaching, and, and um, I believe Moody was preaching at that time and having the powerful song services. And, and so um, the song was arranged by George C. Stebbins. Uh, he sort of helped put together the song. But uh, my understanding is Ufford wrote the song and came up with the tune as well. He just needed a little help in the arrangement. But in the late 1800s, as I would mentioned a moment ago, this was a revivalist period. And in New England area, there were a lot of preaching, fiery sermons going on, and, and appealing to people through song. So let me tell you a little about Ufford, who wrote the song, Throw Out the Lifeline. He, he wrote the song. He was born in Newark, New Jersey in 1851, so he'd have been probably in his 30s uh, when he wrote the song. He educated at Statford Academy in Connecticut, and also he went to theological, theological seminary in Maine. Now, one day, when he was actually in uh, Port Allerton, uh, this is in uh, Massachusetts. Now, I've, I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment of Port Allerton, but I want you to, to visualize a peninsula basically on the edge of the, of the country's shoreline, and it's just this point, you know, with water all around it. And so he was at, he was at uh, Point Allerton, and at Point Allerton, uh, there was a life-saving station. It was a maritime station dedicated to help ships that were in distress. And so he was watching um, this this life station, this life-saving drill that was going on at Point Allerton. There had actually been a shipwreck there, so it was very real to the residents who had witnessed loss of life not long ago, and so they're all thinking, what can we do to prevent this? We need to practice, we need to train, we need to have drills, and so part of that drill was men out there in crafts that are throwing the, the, the life buoy, the, the lifeline, and he was just so impressed <clears throat> watching that lifeline being flung out way over the treacherous water. Another thing that, that impressed him was the fact that, that they moved very quickly, like this was a real situation where lives were being saved. It wasn't just, you know, 
slowly throwing out, yeah, we got to go through this. No, they were, I mean, this was very real to them. It was like, these are people in the water. They need to be rescued. They need to be saved. And so they were moving very quickly. <clears throat> and so it had a real impact on him being an evangelist. He started making this connection in how seriously they took this drill of life-saving and what we as Christians should be doing in sharing the gospel. When he went home, he immediately sat down. Within 15 minutes, he had this composed um, throw out the lifeline. Now, the next slide is going to show the actual peninsula of the city where this happened, Point Allerton, Massachusetts. And you can see, uh, imagine ships out there at night that maybe are off course or in a stormy sea situation and need to be rescued. So another thing that I found in my research on this lesson was the Point Allerton Life Saving Station. It's actually a museum now, and you can go and tour this. It's a beautiful little house with boats and trained personnel that used to live in it. But that's the actual Point Allerton Life Saving Station. It's possible, I don't know this, but maybe some of the staff that you see pictured were involved in that training mission when he wrote the song throw out the lifeline. Very interesting. So it made it very real in his mind. As a matter of fact, he was, he was so taken, he was so impressed by their devotion and the seriousness of their training and life-saving and lifeline throwing that uh, he traveled quite a bit uh, giving illustrations and lectures based on the song that he had written. So he took the song, throw out the lifeline, and began to travel all over the country bringing lessons. As a matter of fact, I've been told that in his lessons, he would set up in the foyer of the little buildings a display of different life-saving things like life rings and vests and things that were used to help people, maybe lanterns, whatever was available back in the late 1800s. But he, he wanted to make it real in the minds of those listening to his lessons. The hymn grew and various congregations started lifeline leagues. Lifeline leagues, think about that. We want to be dedicated to reach lost souls. And we're going to join forces with other congregations and do this. And so this was correct through various states. One person who reflected on this hymn talks about another congregation. This was in, <clears throat> in Maine. He says, or she, the impact of the cherished song was felt in one small church building facing a small inlet in Rockland, Maine. At the rear of the pulpit was a large painting depicting Jesus walking on the water. He was holding out his hand to Peter who was sinking. You remember the story. On the wall at the left of the platform there was a miniature lighthouse. So I'm going to ask that you turn to Matthew 24 and we're going to read, or more at Matthew 14, I'm sorry. <coughs> Matthew 14 we're going to read that account. I know Gentry read some of it for us, but I want to make some points. Matthew 14, 24. I forgot to make an announcement, by the way. Next Sunday night is going to be our pizza kickoff for VBS, so we need drinks, chips, and dessert. So I'm sorry about that. I was supposed to read that at the beginning, but there's your announcement, and I'll remind you again at the end of the lesson. All right, Matthew 14, 24. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land beaten by the waves. The wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. All right, it's a stormy night. They're fighting the waves, probably being battered around with a sail. And if that wasn't bad enough, they look over and they can barely make out the silhouette of something. Is that a person? No, that's impossible. They can't walk on the water. It was Jesus walking on the water. They were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I, I mean, isn't that normal? Wouldn't you assume it's a ghost walking on the water? So here they are, a storm, fighting to maintain control. Immediately, verse 27, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. Oh, it's, it's the master, the Rabboni, the teacher, walking on the water. 
I can't believe it, but it's him. I hear the voice. I recognize Jesus. Peter, of course, is the first to speak up, verse 28. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Lord, I want to come out. I want to walk out there and verify that that is you. Jesus said, come. <laughs> come on, Peter. <laughs> Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, came to Jesus. Now, I don't, I've not ever walked on water. How does that feel? I don't know. Nobody else here has walked on water. Obviously, a miracle has occurred. But about the time Peter's out there walking on the water, he, like a lot of us, starts to look around a little bit thinking, you know, I'm, I'm walking on water. That's unusual. There's the master, but there's also a storm going on. There's winds, there's waves, there's, wind, you know, the crashing of the waves. And so he, he became distracted, apparently, and took his eyes off Jesus. He began to sink. Lord, save me, he says. Now, I want you to look at verse 31. What does your translation say? Jesus let him sink and then reached in. Is that right? Jesus let him get about neck deep in the water. He said, oh, Peter. Is that what happened? How long did it take Jesus to reach down? It says, immediately. Immediately. I want you to remember that word, and you might want to highlight it. If you're a Bible writer, put your pen on there and just write under that immediately. There's an urgency. Jesus didn't let Peter sink long. He didn't wait for bubbles to show up. He reached out immediately and grabbed him. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. My point is this, the Savior came, the Bible tells us, to seek and save that which is lost. Peter, taking a, a, a great step of faith, stepped out on the water, was walking on the water, took his eyes off Jesus, began to sink. Jesus didn't want to teach him a lesson. Don't take your eyes off me, Peter. I'm going to let you sink a while. I'm going to let you think you're drowning. He immediately reached down, grabbed Peter, and rescued him immediately. Now, let's sing the first stanza. I think I've got this up on the screen. And then we're going to sing the refrain or the chorus. And I'd like to talk a little about each stanza as we go through the lesson tonight. But I want you to think about these things. I want you to think about a team that rescues saving people. They throw out the lifeline. That's why the song was written. Also in Matthew, we read about Jesus immediately reaching down and rescuing his brother Peter. There's an urgency for us to look around for lost people, people that are drowning, people that are dying, people that need to be saved. They're all around our community church, good people who are going to hell because they have not obeyed the gospel. They have not made that confession with their mouth. They haven't believed in their heart. Good people who need saving. What are we doing about it? What are we doing to reach them? Are we responding or we're like, eh? That's their choice. No big deal. Let's sing the first stanza in the chorus. Throw out the lifeline across the dark wave. There is a brother whom someone should save. Somebody's brother, oh, who then will dare to throw out the lifeline his peril to share? Throw out the lifeline. Throw out the lifeline, someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is sinking today. Now what Upper does in the next stanza is he challenges us. He says, church, Christians, think about this. You've got to react Quickly, he was so impressed when the rescue team out there on the point was throwing that rescue ring, the lifeline out, pretending that people were really drowning. It was real in their mind. And I want you to realize that lost people is a reality. People die every day outside of Christ. It's tragic. 
And if we'll just have the faith and the courage to say to them, can I tell you about Jesus? Can I share with you my story of how I became saved? We need to react quickly to the idea that someone is perishing. There is not much time. Urgency. Throw out the lifeline with hand quick and strong. Why do you tarry? Why linger so long? See, he is sinking, oh, hasten today. And out with the lifeboat, away then, away. So in the second stanza, he gives us this idea, don't just sit on the bank idly and watch someone perish. Be compelled to go out on the rescue mission. Throw out the lifeline. Do something to rescue that person. A person who responds to a person who is drowning, they don't look around and go, well, am I dressed appropriately? Is my hair straight? I wonder what they'll think of me when I swim out to them and rescue them. You're too ugly. Don't rescue me. No, it's not about us. It's not about how we look or how prepared or educated we are. Not even how physically fit we are. We're going to rescue someone who's drowning. It's a matter of life and death. And I suspect if that individual realizes that they're drowning, they're not going to question your training, your certification, your competency. They'll simply say, thank you. Thank you for going out there and saving my life. Had it not been for your efforts, I would have died. One of the things that I try to remember is that when I stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, on that great day where the Lamb's Book of Life is opened up and we stand before His throne, the judgment seat of Christ, I hope, at least I visualize, that there may be people who come up to me and say, Tom, had you not shared the gospel with me, today would have been a very different day. The outcome would have been very different for me had you not talked about Jesus and his blood. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you contrast that with me standing there and somebody's looking at me and I'm in that line to go to heaven and they're like, you knew about this. Why didn't you tell me? You knew about Jesus and what he had done, but you said nothing. We need to realize that we have an opportunity to make a profound difference on this earth. He asked the question, what causes these precious souls to drift away? I'm speaking metaphorically, not literally, because we know that there's things like riptides and currents in the ocean that take them out to sea. But he's speaking metaphorically now, what causes souls to drift out to their ultimate death? He says that it's the winds of temptation and the billows of woe. There's two things that cause people to be lost. One is Satan is always there luring people away from the shoreline. Leave the safety of Jesus. Come out here. Have fun. Come out here. He lures them out. He wants them to be destroyed. And another tool that Satan uses is sorrow and woe. How could a God who loves people allow this to happen to me or a person in, in deep sadness or depression and all of a sudden they become angry or bitter at God? It happens all the time. And so we has, as rescuers need to remember to help people, to give them hope, to help them overcome the temptations that we all face. But those temptations, times of sadness, discouragement, and a lack of trust in God cause people to die without a savior. Let's sing the next stanza. Throw out the lifeline to danger fraught men, sinking in anguish where you've never been. Winds of temptation and billows of woe soon lure them out where the dark waters flow. Listen to what he says, <coughs> excuse me, in the next stanza. This is the lifeline O tempest-tossed men, baffled by waves of temptation and sin, 
Wild winds of passion your strength cannot brave. But Jesus is mighty. Jesus can save. What's the answer? Simply, church, the answer is that in these stanzas, stanza three and four, we understand that we're simply the messenger, but it is Jesus who saves. Amen? Amen. It's Jesus. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Ephesians 1, 7. His blood, only his blood, can take away man's sin. All are destined to a life of punishment and death, save the blood of Jesus. If we're covered in the blood of Jesus, our sins are washed away, our sins are forgiven. And this is that beautiful message of the gospel, that Jesus died and that he was buried in the tomb. And just as he said he would, he rose three days later on the first day of the week to live again. But in the process of the death, burial, and resurrection, he poured out his blood for us. When we, Romans 10, make that confession with our mouth and we believe in our heart and we obey the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, we are symbolically and by faith covered in the blood of Jesus and our sins are washed away. Our sins are removed and that's how we are saved. Go back and look at the book of Acts from the beginning to the end. Every example of a person becoming an obedient child of God goes through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. This is all done in water baptism, believing in their heart, confessing with their mouth, and being washed in the blood of Jesus. Jesus can save us. And that's the message that we bring when we share the gospel. It's a very simple message that I can teach to somebody on a fourth grade level. The death, the burial, the resurrection. Your obedience is, is, is mirrored in water baptism. And it's Jesus who saves you. It's not me. I'm just the messenger. Jesus is able to you who are driven farther and farther from God and from heaven, helpless and hopeless, overwhelmed by the way. We throw out the lifeline. Tis Jesus can save. This is the lifeline. Oh, grasp it today. See, you are recklessly drifting away. Voices and warning shout over the wave. Oh, grasp the strong lifeline, for Jesus can save. That lifeline that we throw out is not a literal rope and a life ring. The lifeline that we throw out is the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. And now we're saying to them, you've got the lifeline in front of you. There is that boy, that ring that can save your life with the rope. Would you take hold of it? Would you grab on? Would you hold on to this and let us save you before you perish? We must throw out the lifeline. We must broadcast, share, spread, teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, church. And if we don't, I believe the Lord on that day is going to say, Who did you tell about me? Who did you share the message of Jesus with? in order to save them. Oh, I can imagine the excuses that may come. But Lord, I was too busy, too distracted, not trained, not capable. What excuses would you want to give God for not telling others who are lost about his son? I cannot speak for anyone else. I can only speak for me, and that is this. With a message so simple and a love so great, how can I not share the gospel? With a lost world. What excuse do I have? There is none. And so I must save while I have time. I must reach out to precious souls who need Jesus. Let's sing this last stanza together in the refrain, and then the lesson will be yours. I'm going to simply uh, sit down and, or, or stand aside and let Stephen lead us in an invitation song. Maybe, just maybe tonight, there's someone listening who has not yet become a Christian, has not been immersed in the waters of baptism someone who's not gone through their own death, burial, and resurrection. If you'd like to learn more, please let us know. But if you're not a Christian and you're ready to become a Christian tonight, we're ready to immerse you in those waters of baptism. We're ready to help you be saved according to the Bible. We want you to grab the lifeline before you drift away, before you no longer wish to let Jesus be your Savior. 
And so please, if you need to, grab the lifeline tonight. This is the lifeline, oh, grasp it today. See, you are recklessly drifting away. Voices and warnings shout over the way. Oh, grasp the strong lifeline, for Jesus can say. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Stand with me, please. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Most holy one, oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed Son. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now my Savior, I come to Thee. Thank you, Brother Tom. Reminder, if anyone, <coughs> excuse me, uh, still needs to partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we'll have it right back in room one. <coughs> and any more announcements? Tom was going to remind about next week was the pizza and the ask him out in the lobby if we have any questions. Uh, okay, closing song. First and last. <clears throat> Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever Flowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather at the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. At the smiling of the river, mirror of the Savior's face, saints whom death will never sever, lift their songs of saving grace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Before we pray,
I learned something this weekend, that we have the authority to pray to God through Jesus Christ. And not only do we have the authority, we have the assurance that as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord will answer our prayers. And to back that up, he's got the Holy Spirit that's going to interpret for us to make sure that our prayers that we meant to bring out, that we didn't have enough words to bring out, are taken care of for us. So let's all go together for prayer. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given unto us. We thank you for the love that you allow us to experience. We thank you for the struggles that we're able to go through. We thank you for the hardships that we see. They break our hearts. And we thank you, dear Lord, that you're there to pick us up, put us back together, and let us know that like Jesus at the boat, you'll pick us up and carry us out and let us be one with you. We ask, dear Lord, that you put a protection over all of us from all the pestilences and the diseases that's going around. And we ask that you allow us to set the example to shine the light on the hill, take away our inhibitions, take away our fears. And we ask, dear Lord, that as we come forth and we stand before you, we will know that we've done well. Help us to see those souls that need to be saved. Help us to get the courage to walk up to them and actually talk to them. Help us most effectively to talk to the family members that we have that are living for the world. We know, dear Lord, that we can't save, and our job is to light the fire, to plant the seed, that you may bring it forth to fruition. But, dear Lord, be with us as we go forth to do this. Dear Lord, be with our children. Help us to set the example that they would look forward to following the light up on the hill. Take away all of our inhibitions and our need for the things of the world that we do not deflect from them and show them that you are the one, the true God that we worship and we stand before. Help us not to fear the men of the world because the most they can do is kill us. We stand forth to, to be united with you. Let us look up on the hills to see the chariots and all the reinforcements that you have that when we start feeling down. You've helped us through many times and many things. We've had many deaths in, the, in this congregation as we've had one this week. And we ask that you be with the family of Janice Moore that they would be comforted through you and your Holy Spirit. I, as I looked at Becky today, I could see the fear in her eyes and the hurt. We ask, dear Lord, that as we depart and we see Becky, we can call her and give her cards, try to encourage her to let her know that she is now a part of a family that love her very much. And dear Lord, as we go forth into the world and we leave this place, keep us safe until we return. If it be your will, we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.